Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today we're continuing with the 24 switch keyboard that I'm developing for the Pico. Last time we built a scanned keyboard complete with a socket for the Pico and for an OLED display. Then I wrote a proof of concept script in MicroPython to demonstrate keyboard scanning. This time I want to create a much faster program in C that incorporates interrupts and key decoding. So why don't you join me as we complete our scanned keyboard for the Raspberry Pi Pico. The 24 switch keyboard we built last time was arranged in four rows and six columns. Please see my previous video on the theory and construction of this keyboard. I use MicroPython and Programmable Input Output or PIO to check for a key press and identify the row and column. I want to use this keyboard with other C++ and assembly applications, so my first step in creating a useful keyboard is to convert the MicroPython program to C. Let's review the flow diagram as we convert the PIO program. Remember, the PIO program performs the actual keyboard scanning function. It returns the row and column of the press key to the main program for further data manipulation. In MicroPython, the PIO program is part of the main program file, while the PIO program is in a separate file for C. The PIO commands are the same between the two languages, just with different syntax. I'll put them side by side as we convert. We begin by defining the program name and specifying the wrap target location. Then I'll set the label Begin Again. As we discussed in the last video, the row scanning sequence is defined using a special sequencing word that's stored in the output shift register, or OSR. I'll grab that word from the main program here at the beginning. I don't want to burden the main program with loading the special sequencing word into the OSR for every scan, so I'll use a non-blocking pull. If the FIFO is empty, then a non-blocking pull is treated the same as a move from the X register into the OSR. So right after I load the OSR for the first time, I move the value of the OSR into the X register to preserve the special sequencing word for the life of the program. Then I won't need to constantly fill the OSR from the main program. The next section of code turns on all the rows to see if any key has been pressed. I'll begin this section with the label Start Scan. Then I'll turn on all four rows by outputting 15 decimal or 1111 binary to the set pins, which we'll define later during instantiation. The status of the six columns is read from the in pins, which is also defined during instantiation. I'll move the in pin status to the Y register for zero testing. If the Y register is zero, meaning that all of the column inputs were low, then no key was pressed and execution will jump back to the beginning of start scan. If the Y register is not zero, then one of the inputs was high, meaning a key was pressed. In that case, execution falls through the jump statement to the label output OSR. This jump instruction checks that the OSR still has data. If the OSR is not empty, then execution will skip over the wrap statement and will begin scanning. If the OSR is empty, execution falls through the jump to the wrap statement, which will load the OSR with the special sequencing word and start detection again. To identify the row and column of the press key, first clear the input shift register of any previous results. Then output the four least significant bits of the OSR which will turn on one of the four output pins. Read the six columns into the ISR and transfer the results to the Y register for zero testing. Then load the row bits from the OSR into the four least significant bits of the ISR. At this point, the ISR contains the row selection in bits zero through three and the column results in bits four through nine. Discard the duplicate row sequence nibble we just read from the OSR using the out statement. If no button press was detected, jump back to the beginning of the key identification routine and check the next row. However, if there was a key press detected, push the results of the ISR to the receive FIFO and enter the check button off routine. Once again, 
turn on all the rows, read the columns, move the input into the Y register for zero testing, and if the key has been released, jump to the beginning of the scanning routine. If the key hasn't been released, continue to check until it has been. Now we've converted the PIO from MicroPython into C, but we still have to convert the PIO configuration. We'll create a method inside the PIO file that generates the PIO configuration. This method is called by a helper function in our C program that instantiates the state machine. The percent %C SDK statement requests that the following code be passed through the C C++ SDK. We'll include the clocks library for calculation of the state machine speed, then define the helper function. We'll start with the default configuration and initialize the four GPIO pins. You'll need to do this if they're going to become outputs. Then tell the state machine that those pins will be outputs. Tell the state machine that the outputs will be mapped to both the out and set pin groups. Set the pin direction as inputs for the six column pins. Set the OSR to shift right with no auto pull, and set the ISR to shift left with no auto push. Map the column inputs to the in pin group. Set the state machine clock rate. Load the PIO configuration, jump to the start of the program, and then start the state machine running. That's it for the PIO program. Now we need a simple C program to start the PIO program and to display the keyboard data. I'll display the data using the Pico's USB port through a terminal emulator. I'll start out by including all the various libraries and programs we will need, including the PIO program we just wrote. I'll also define a couple global variables to define the PIO block and state machine number. Next is the helper function that will instantiate the state machine. The SDK will assign the PIO block and PIO program starting offset. These two statements will memorialize these values as we will need them later. The next two statements define the first GPIO pin in each of the output and input pin groups. That would be GPIO 12 for the row outputs and GPIO 6 for the column inputs. Here we set the state machine clock frequency to 2000 Hz, again about as slow as possible to help us with debugging. This statement requests the SDK to assign an unused state machine and to memorialize the selection. Finally, we call the method in the PIO program to instantiate the state machine. Finally, let's look at the main C program. First, initialize the standard input-output routines. I'm using the Pico's USB port to output data from the program. I'll use PuTTY to display that data. Since it takes me a few seconds to start PuTTY after I initialize the Pico, I add a 10-second delay before I continue the program execution. Then I output Start Program, signaling the delay is over and the keyboard scanning can start. Next, I call the helper function to instantiate PIO0. The next two statements load the special sequencing word into the transmit FIFO. Then we enter an infinite loop where we use a blocking get to wait for the key data from the PIO program. Then I'll strip out the row and column data for printout. Finally, I'll print out the row and column data. Let's try it out. I'll include a link to all the files used in this video in the description below. In the CList file, I'll initialize the USB for output. After the CMake and NMake process, I'll insert the USB cable into the Pico while pressing the Boot Select button. Then I'll copy the UF2 file into the Pico. I'll start PuTTY to receive the output data. After 10 seconds, the program starts. I'll press a key and the row and column are printed out to the screen. Success, but we're not done. 
In the last program, the main C program simply waits for the data. But since I need the processors to do something else besides just waiting, I'll use an interrupt to free up processor time to do other things. In this proof of concept, I merged the script from the PIO Chronicles episode 19 with the last program. In short, I add an interrupt and wait for the PIO program just before the push. In the C program, I'll add a callback routine that outputs the interrupt information, such as the interrupt number and the value of the INTR register before and after clearing. After the interrupt is cleared, I print the key row and column information. I add PIO interrupt initialization and enabling to the original PIO instantiation helper function. I set the PIO interrupt handler to the NVIC and then enable that NVIC interrupt. Finally, I set up an infinite loop where I print a dot every second. When I press a key, it fires the PIO interrupt 2, invoking the interrupt handler and printing the data. Let's try it out. You can see that the processor does its own thing, you know, printing dots, until I press a key. Then I get the key scan info before the processor goes back to the thrilling job of printing dots again. The clock rate is still slow for debugging, but I think we can speed things up now. In the next program, I remove most of the delays in each PIO statement. I also change the PIO interrupt number to zero. In the C program, I streamline the interrupt handler, only clearing PIO interrupt zero and not printing the interrupt information. The clock frequency is still 2000 Hz. That provides good switch debouncing. And I still use the infinite loop. I just don't print the dot anymore. Here is a demonstration. You can see that the row and column numbers are printed quickly and reliably. Having the key row and column is great, but I still need to do something useful. For that, I'll decode the key rows and columns into ASCII characters. I've segregated my keyboard into a 4x4 matrix, which will represent hexadecimal digits, and a 4x2 matrix, which will control functions. The PIO program is exactly the same as the previous program. In the C program, I'll first define the 4x6 global array that contains the ASCII characters I want to assign to each key. The value corresponds to the row and column of each key. The PIO scan program represents the row and column data as a single bit occupying bits 0 through 3 of the row number or 0 through 5 of the column number. I need to convert that to decimal to simplify the decoding. In this routine, I simply start with 0 and begin incrementing the counter while shifting the row or column number right until I find the single set bit. Then I output the counter as a decimal equivalent. After the row and column is converted to decimal, I just use those values to look up the ASCII character and then print it out. For now, I just chose symbols for the eight function keys. Let's try it out. In this case, I print out the decimal key and row numbers as well as the decoded ASCII character. Success! Thanks for joining me today. This time we converted my 24-button keyboard PIO scanning program to C, added interrupts, made it faster, and added key decoding. I'm ready to begin interfacing the keyboard with the SSD 1306 OLED display that's also on this board, so stay tuned. If you like this video or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.